Right. Um, as Mark said, I'm Curtis Young, and I'm with the Ohio State as well. I've been in, in extension for 31 years now, um, and we'll be around for a couple more years beyond that. I am trained as an entomologist, so that is my main area of specialization. However, I've been working with the Master Gardener program since I started with Extension and have picked up a number of topics along the way for presenting to Master Gardener trainees, as well as I'm highly involved in our diagnostic clinics that we put on on an annual basis, which I think one of them is going to be in Hancock County um, this summer. We don't have all the dates set as of yet, but we know the counties that they are going to be in. And that's an all-day program where we have some educational um, programs in the morning, and then we have hands-on training in the afternoon where we bring in samples of all kinds of materials that is actually occurring in the field at that time so that we can work through the process of diagnostics in, in determining what we can tell from a sample and what we can't tell from a sample and what we need to do if we can't get the answer just from looking at the sample from there. And of course that includes insect problems, disease problems, environmental problems, and the list goes on and on. Um, so uh, I've been working with plant pathology for quite a long time as well as the entomology. So today's um, lesson is the plant pathology, which is the study of pathogens that cause diseases in plants. Now that's kind of a broad definition there because it also includes environmental conditions that will produce symptomology that looks like a disease when it's actually just something that's off in the environment causing a degradation in the plant. We will mostly concentrate on the biological agents, the living organisms that cause disease in plants. But we'll touch on some of the environmental problems as well, um, simply so you can get an understanding of how to distinguish between the two. Um, terminology, there's always going to be words that you have to become aware of that are associated with a particular discipline, in this case, plant pathology. At the top of the list there, we have the pathogen. And the pathogen is any virulent disease-causing organism. And there's a list of them that we'll look at here a little bit later. So this is the actual living organism that causes the problem in the plant. And there's some other characteristics about that we'll look at later as well. The term host, that is a plant that is susceptible to the pathogen. and so. It is going to be the other half of the living organisms that are in this relationship um, that is going to be impacted by the pathogen. Um, and susceptibility will vary from individual to individual. Um, some plants will have what appears to be resistance to a pathogen, but if the environment is severe enough that it's stressing the plant, that resistance can potentially disappear. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, the next few terms here, this almost sounds like hair splitting when it comes to talking about disease in plants. However, the pathologists are very, very um, intense about saying we have signs or we have symptoms. Signs are visible parts of the pathogen, which we actually don't see very often. And the reason behind that is most of our pathogens that cause disease in plants are microscopic in nature. So they're very tiny. So unless you're looking through a microscope on a prepared slide, you may never see the actual organism that's causing the disease. What we do see frequently are symptoms of the disease and the organism that is causing that disease. And symptoms are the actual injury that we see on the plant. And there's all kinds of symptoms that we describe for different diseases. And um, one of the challenges about that symptomology, um, in contrast to something like entomology. In entomology, we see the insect, we identify the insect, it's pretty obvious what the insect is. In plant pathology, if we're working primarily from symptoms, symptoms can be very similar from plant to plant to plant 
that may not have the same disease. And it can become incredibly frustrating. Well, one of the things, or one of the things that I have in my office, I have two references, and they're both from Cornell University. And one of them is entitled The Insects of Trees and Shrubs. That, is, when you see that book in my office, it is tattered because I use it all the time. Then there's a compendium book of the same uh, ilk in terms of how it presents uh, the plant pathogens. That one is in pristine condition. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not that I have anything against plant pathology, but when you start looking at the different descriptions of the diseases in that book, it's page after page after page of exactly the same thing. Um, which is frustrating, and, and that's one of the challenges with plant pathology. It, it's not nearly as easy to work through that process of diagnostics with plant pathogens. And in fact, even if an individual that has a lot of experience in the field and has diagnosed a lot of different problems with plants, when it comes to diseases, when I'm talking to a client, I, say, I will have to say, this appears to be this particular disease, but I can't give you a 100% answer until we send it to the lab. And once it's been sent to the lab, they will go through procedures that will verify the diagnostics. Um, but we can't, we can't say with absolute 100% certainty in most cases that this symptomology is because of that disease. Now we can have a pretty good idea, um, and some things are pretty obvious, but a lot of the diseases can be a real challenge when it comes to field diagnostics. So that's a, a warning up front. Even though we know a lot about diseases and what causes problems in plants, it's still not gonna be an easy task to cover that in the, the field. Um, and then when we get down to the last term here, pesticides, um, there are several different types of pesticides that might be employed to manage plant diseases. And it depends on the pathogen that is causing the disease in the plant. So some of the common pesticides include fungicides. In fact, there's a lot of fungicides that are, are sold to manage plant diseases. And we'll come back to that point here a little bit later as well. There may be nematocytes. Anybody know what a nematode is? I've heard of them. Yes. <laughs> it's a parasitic round worm. It's an animal Ooh. that causes diseases in plants. And so since it's a nematode, the type of pesticides we use against it are nematocytes. Okay? Um, so fungicides for fungi, nematicides for nematodes, and then antibiotics. Germs. Well, okay. Uh, what do you mean by germs? What kind of organism are we looking at? Bacterial. Yeah. So we use antibiotics to manage bacterial diseases in ourselves. We also have some antibiotics that we use in plants. Um, to take care of a few of the different types of bacterial diseases that can impact the plants. So um, it, it all depends on what kind of organism that we're targeting as to what kind of pesticide might be employed to manage that disease. And it, in many cases, unfortunately, <laughs> there may not be any product that we can say, go buy this and spray it on your plant. Er, and, and so again, there are some challenges there. All right, um, so the study of plant diseases. So we're looking at biological caused plant distortion, decline, distress, and possibly even death, depending on the severity of the disease that's impacting the plant. And absolutely, there are different plant pathogens that can wipe out a plant in a relatively short period of time. Sometimes the disease is a progressive disease, and it may take several years for it eventually to lead to the death of the plant. Or, if it's not a direct cause of the death of the plant, 
it has run down the plant so badly that then the environment takes over and puts the last nail in the coffin. Or an insect detects the stressed plant and moves in and puts the last nail in the coffin. Um, so it's not always obvious that it is the plant pathogen that has started that ball rolling, but in many cases it can be. Um, we're looking at the biologically caused uh, types of plant pathogens. Um, and so the pathogen may be a virus, a phytoplasm, a bacteria, a fungi, or a nematode. So there's five different causative agents of plant disease. Um, now some of these, like viruses, they are incredibly difficult to deal with. And if it is a significant enough viral disease, the only choice of management is destroy the plant. Because if you don't destroy the plant, that virus may, may spread from host plant to host plant to host plant that is a host of that virus. So I, I ha, I'm, it's almost sounded like I'm talking in circles there, but I'm not. Um, our plant pathogens usually aren't broad spectrum. <coughs> They're not going to hit every single plant in a the landscape. They are usually fairly narrowly specialized on particular plants. So if you have a viral disease in a tree over here in the corner of the yard, there may not be any other plant that can be a host of that viral disease within the yard. So you just have to deal with that one plant. So they are relatively specialized to the hosts that they will impact, which is good and bad. Uh, it's good from the, the perspective of they're not going to hit absolutely every plant in your landscape and wipe out the entire landscape. But for those that they are significant pests to, it could be disaster for that particular plant. The other aspect to make a true pathogen is it has to be infectious. In other words, transferable. So when we talk about the abiotic plant pathogens, things that are caused by the environment, you can't transfer that environment from one plant to another. The environment is the environment, what the plant is growing in. So that kind of disease is not transferable from one host to another to another. In fact, <coughs> if it is an environmentally caused plant pathogen, quote unquote, probably every plant in the landscape is gonna suffer from it because it's gonna be things like water stress or it could be flooding um, or it could be salt or it could be any number of other things that are attributed to the environment that are not transferable to a new environment. So they have to be transferable. In fact, this is one of the criteria that the lab uses to determine if what they have isolated from a disease plant is going to be a pathogen of other plants of the same type. It has to be transferable from a disease plant to a healthy plant. If you can't transfer it, then that's probably not the causative agent of the disease that you're looking for. Um, disease and plant injury, uh, the pathogen, due to its functioning, whatever it's doing in that plant, whether it's reproducing, whether it's acquiring nutrition, um, whatever it's doing in that host of the disease, it's going to interfere some way in normal plant function. Um, it may simply be a, a degradation in the appearance of the plant. Um, it may not be as brilliant in its color. Um, it may have a lessened growth rate than what it would have without the pathogen. Um, it may cause breakdown of tissues. It may produce diseased, obvious decay in areas of the plant. Um, so it's doing something to interfere with the normal function of the plant. The plant may not be able to re reproduce itself because it's so stressed by the pathogen that's there. That disease-causing organism usually produces a very close relationship with its host. In fact, many of them actually live in the tissues of the host that they're causing the disease in. Um, and so to be able to live inside of your host, you better have a very um, 
very coordinated union between the disease causing organism and the, the host that is um, susceptible to it. Again, the plant pathogen obtains its nutrition from the host plant, so it's stealing from the host plant in that perspective, as well as the pathogen may actually take over the machinery of the host and cause the host to make copies of the pathogen, especially in viruses. Now, viruses do not have the capability of reproducing themselves outside of their host. They are absolute obligate parasites that have to be in its host tissues to be able to reproduce. Um, viruses are very, very simplistic organisms when it comes down to it. In fact, in the biology world, we still have arguments as to whether a virus is a living organism or not because a virus is usually composed of a strand of DNA or a strand of RNA and a protein coat around it. It has no other machinery to it. Mm -hmm. So with that little strand of DNA or strand of <coughs> RNA, it inserts itself into its host. And then by doing that, it causes the host's DNA to start making more viruses. And that's whether it's an animal virus a plant virus, or whatever virus you're talking about, it works the same way. Could you name what those things are, just name them? Oh, what we have here in the site? <coughs> yep, gonna get them right here in a second. Okay. Um, so, uh, when it takes over that machinery, uh, again, it's gonna be stealing from the host plant. And over here, uh, we're looking at some of the distortions that can occur to the host plant as a result of a disease being there. Um, the plant in the background, that is eastern red cedar. Mm -hmm. So eastern red cedar is a misnamed plant because eastern red cedar is juniper. <laughs> yeah. And so the, the proper name of the eastern red cedar is Juniperus virginiana. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with cedar, um, but that's what um, the common name that got labeled to it. And that gall structure, G-A-L-L, -L, mm -hmm. That gall structure is a piece of that host plant that has been distorted by the fungus. Mm -hmm. And the fungus in this case is the ap cedar apple rust. Mm -hmm. The next image down here, that's eastern red cedar again. Mm -hmm. And that is that gall when it begins to produce spores. Oh, yeah. cool. And so um, that's the overwintering condition of that fungus on that host. And when it's ready to produce spores, it becomes this orange gelatinous octopus hanging on the host plant. And these can be as big as tennis balls. They can be huge. And they can be numerous in the eastern red cedar. Now, these tentacles are gelatinous, but as they dry out, they release spores. And those spores are picked up in the air, and float to the alternate host of that disease, which is apple. Or, I should say more appropriately, a plant in the rosaceae family, mm -hmm. the roses. So it could be crab apples, it could be hawthorn, it could be orchard apples, um, and several other rose members that are susceptible to that rust disease. Mm -hmm. So that's just two phases of the same fungus. And this plant down here in the corner, which we don't grow around here at all, is tobacco. And tobacco is very susceptible to a virus. And that virus is called tobacco mosaic virus. And so when you look at the leaf there, that chlorotic pattern in that leaf is kind of like a mosaic across the leaf. Thus, it got its name, tobacco mosaic virus. Now, why would I even bring that up? Up here north, where we produce no tobacco. Any idea? Because it runs out of other crops. Okay, and what other crops might that be? Tomato, then. Tomato, yeah. Or watermelon. Yeah. Also petunias. Mm -hmm. um, and there's actually a long list of plants in the plant family, Solanaceae, which is the nightshade plants. So that's which, why you're not supposed to smoke. Yes, uh, well, that's part of it. 
that when you're working in a greenhouse, they don't like people who smoke because that virus can live in the tobacco of the cigarettes. And it can be transferred to the living plants in the greenhouse. So yes, um, that, is, that is an actual serious problem for greenhouse producers of tomatoes, of, of, pe of peppers, and, and uh, any <coughs> a number of ornamental plants. So yeah, it could be a significant problem. And the only way to get rid of it is to destroy the plants mm -hmm. and take them out of the greenhouse. So. All right, so I've already mentioned this once, and that is one of the characteristics of most of our plant pathogens is the fact that they are microscopic. Mm -hmm. They are incredibly tiny. Um, and as we go down through here, um, you can't see the vast majority in the, with the naked eye. <coughs> but there are a couple, and we'll see those as we go along here. Um, it will require some sort of magnification. It might be simple as a magnifying glass or a dissecting scope, or it's gonna be a compound like microscope that you have to use, or in some cases, it's an electron microscope, which is a very expensive piece of equipment. Um, and so down here in the corner, this uh, micrograph, which is a fancy way of saying a photograph that was taken through a microscope, uh, is of that tobacco mosaic virus. So these rods are the viral particles, and they have to be magnified 100,000 times for you to be able to see them. So that's how small they are. This particular diagram over here to the right-hand side goes further to show you the relationship of a lot of the different types of plant pathogens in comparison to a single plant cell a single plant cell. So um, there's a, fun, a, a piece of a fungus that has entered into that host cell. So you can see there's one, two, three, four cells of the fungus that fit inside of a single plant cell. Um, you see uh, bacteria, and you can see there could probably be several thousand bacterial cells inside of a single plant cell. Um, mycoplasmas, which are now called phytoplasmas, which are kind of naked bacterial cells. Likewise, you could have several thousand. There's the viral particles, mm -hmm. you know, represented by tiny little stickles inside of that cell. So we have fungi, we have bacteria, we have phytoplasms, we have viruses, and then finally the last group are nematodes. And there's the head and of a nematode sticking into a single plant cell to feed inside of that cell. So that's emphasizing that all of these things are gonna be very, very tiny. And that's part of the reason that it's very difficult to say with absolute certainty in the field that that's what we are seeing causing this disease. That's why we have to send it to the lab for verification in many cases. Now, uh, back up here, if I see this in the field, it's like, yeah, that's a given. That is cedar apple rust. There, there's nothing else that does that in eastern Red Sea. So there are certain ones that are, are easy to do in the field, but many others, it's gonna take some special procedures to get to them. All right, what do pathogens do to a host plant? Well, this diagram here, this is a very, very, very common diagram that we see in just about every plant pathology book ever published. Um, and the, the, what the diagram is depicting is on the left-hand side, this is what the plant parts should be doing for the plant. Um, so you can see there's, there's flowers up here that eventually produce the, the fruits of the plant, which is its reproductive <coughs> capabilities. Um, we have terminal buds, that's the point at which the plant grows taller. We have the leaves that do all kinds of functions for the plant, such as most of your photosynthesis occurs in the leaves of the plant. But the um, movement of water up and through that plant requires um, a, an action called transpiration. And transpiration is the loss of water through the leaves. And you're thinking, you know, what good does that do for a plant to lose water through the leaves? Well, that's one of the forces 
that allows a plant to gain water from the soil and pull it up through the plant to the greatest heights. So like a giant redwood sequoia that is three, four, five hundred feet tall, there is no pump mechanism in that plant like a heart to physically pump water up through the plant. It depends on three things. One is um, cohesion between the, um, between the water molecules. Adhesion, water molecules holding on to the cell walls that they're being transported out through, and transpiration. So it's kind of a push, pull, and pull to get that water to go up through the plant. So um, it depends on leaves. Uh, plants lose most their, of their water when they have leaves out. Once the leaves fall off the plant, the amount of transpiration that occurs through that plant is highly reduced until new leaves are put onto the plant. So it's a, an, a necessary evil to get water to move through the plant. You have to lose some of it out to the atmosphere. So that happens mostly in the leaf. Transport materials up and down in the plant occurs through the main stems and the branches. Um, the roots are down in the soil providing structural support to hold that plant in place, as well as for it to acquire water and minerals out of that soil to move up through the rest of the plant to support it. So those are all the things that are supposed to be happening in the plant. The diseases, when they infect the plant, will impact one or several of those functions that those plant parts should be doing. Um, such as down here, you can get root rots. Well, when you rot your roots off, now you can't get the water and minerals out of the soil. You may have uh, crown galls around the base of the plant. And they, these crown gall is usually caused by a bacterium. And if you get crown gall in a plant, you might as well dig that plant out and throw it away. You're never going to cure that problem. And it does produce a massive, unusual looking growth at the bottom of the plant. Um, we have wilts uh, due to vascular tissue being clogged by one of the pathogens. Uh, we have spots and specks and lesions and blotches on the leaves that take away from the photosynthetic area of the plant. You can have fruit rots, which result in the destruction of the reproductive capability of the plant. Um, you can have shoot blights. You can have terminal blights that prevent the plant from growing further out. So um, anything that is a living organism that interferes with the normal function of the plant is going to be a pathogen of that plant. And in the diversity of pathogens we have, there isn't a plant part that is particularly safe from a potential pathogen. All right, so some basic characteristics that we often associate with diseases. And when we talk diseases of plants, when do you really think about diseases impacting your plants the most? Just from your general experience, when do you often think of diseases setting in? when it's wet. And when is it usually wet? In the, in the spring. And what else goes along with that wetness during the spring? So, well, you expect your plants to be growing in the spring. Sometimes you get warmer temperatures. Sometimes, <laughs> but usually it's cool, cool. cool to cold. So, and this may be a false impression to um, basically think that all diseases are going to, only going to occur in the spring and they're only gonna occur when it's wet. Um, it's not. Now, a number of them do. And in fact, when we look at that, um, a lot of our fungal diseases do set in when it's wet and generally when it's cool. And since we know the most about our fungal diseases, it gives us a false impression that's, that's when most of your diseases are going to set in. And certainly there are some really, really significant diseases that we occur in, during the, the spring when it's wet and cool. But it's not only them. There are definitely some of our diseases that like hot and wet. Um, there are other diseases that um, just have to have new growth available to them. And so as long as that plant is generating new growth, it is potentially susceptible to a disease. Um, so uh, we have to be careful with our generalities 
um, because it's going to lead into trouble for us if we only think of those generalities. But when we talk about fungi, that, that's the disease we have the most experience with. Um, now, the other ones are catching up in terms of our knowledge and experience here. Uh, but because the fungi had garnered most of the attention, we associate disease with those types of conditions. Most of our pathogens have a relatively limited host range. And what I mean by that is um, they may only have one species of plant that they infect. Or there may only be a single genus of plants that they infect. Or it might be a whole family of plants. But usually it doesn't go beyond the family level of identification of plants that a disease will be rampant within the group. And when I say family genus species, you've been introduced to plant or, or to, to um, taxonomy, you know, where we break out all living organisms into categories of kingdom, phylum, um, class, order, family, genus, and species. Um, where that comes into play here with plant pathogen is understanding who's related to whom. Just like I said with that tobacco mosaic virus, just about any plant in the nightshade family can be susceptible to tobacco mosaic virus. Any plant outside of that family is not going to get tobacco mosaic virus. Now I'll twist that around and you're just gonna moan at me. You can have symptomology that looks like tobacco uh, mosaic virus in other plants, but if they're not nightshade family, it's not tobacco mosaic. Um, so that, that's something that we try to emphasize when we talk about plant pathogens. Um, now, what if uh, somebody brought to you a plant such as lilac, and the leaves of that lilac plant were covered with this um, white, grayish material, especially the, the leaves low on the plant out of the sunshine? What, what do you think that might be called? Powdery mildew. Powdery mildew, absolutely. And that's, that's another one that's given. Yeah, that's powdery mildew. It always gets powdery mildew. Now, are there other plants that give powdery mildew? Mm -hmm. Such as? Grapes. Grapes mm -hmm. give powdery mildew. Anything else? That might actually be downy mildew, but we won't go well, there. <laughs> it's a squash. A squash, zucchini, summer squash, mm -hmm. pumpkins. They all get a powdery mildew. Peenies. Uh, Peenies get a powdery mildew. Yeah. So if you start thinking about powdery mildew, now we've talked about a shrub, we've talked about a tree, we've talked about a vine, we've talked about a vegetable, and they all get powdery mildew. Are they all in the same plant family? No, no they're not. They're not all the same powdery mildew either. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Every single one of those plants has its own species of powdery mildew. Mm -hmm. And those powdery mildew all generate a common symptomology. And so that's, again, one of those places that we have to be careful of doing our diagnostics in the field. Yeah, it's easy, very easy to recognize powdery mildew. But that powdery mildew of your peonies did not jump over to the lilac. Mm -hmm. That powdery mildew on your lilac didn't jump over to your zucchini. Um, and you know, even oak trees have powdery mildew. Mm -hmm. And the list goes on and on. They're each a different species of organism. Mm -hmm. So we're still safe with that idea that a pathogen can only infect maybe a family of plants, maybe a genus of plants, or maybe just one species of plant. So it's just a, an awareness that we have to, to be certain of. Again, the pathogen invades the host plant tissues. It becomes intricately involved with the tissues of that plant, eventually destroying those tissues and uh, emphasizing, again, most are microscopic in size. So, um, pre pre presents a real challenge to diagnostics because uh, you're not walking around with a microscope in your hand out in the field, uh, and definitely not an electron microscope. Uh, they require an entire room to set one of those up. Um, it may require 
um, you know, culture media to attempt to grow the pathogen in to verify what it is. Um, viewed with a microscope or electron microscope that's going to be in the lab and signs and symptoms, um, things that are visible in the field can be similar from pathogen to pathogen. So signs, the actual organism, when we do see them, it's usually not just an individual of that pathogen. It's usually a colony, a whole bunch of them growing together in a common area. So you're not seeing the individual pathogen, you're seeing many of them, and there's so many of them all in one spot that they become visible to the naked eye. Now, especially in fungi. Um, a fungi or a fungus, it has a couple of different colonies that it grows in, and they're called mycelia, or a mycelium. Um, now, there are two different types of mycelium. One type is the feeding mycelium, which produces a mat of growth over something, like that powdery mildew, that, that powdery white material over the surface of the leaf. That's a feeding mycelium. And then the other type of mycelium that we will see is a reproductive mycelium. And so in the fungi, the common ones that we see are called mushrooms. A mushroom is a reproductive body of a fungus. And that's its sole purpose, is for reproduction. When it, when it grows, it produces spores, and those spores are released out into the environment. And it's a sexual reproduction that occurs in that mushroom. The rest of that mushroom is a mycelium growing down in the soil, or it's growing in the, into the interior parts of the plant that you can't see, all right? So um, in the image over here, this is a turf grass disease, and we'll see a larger example of this same image in the next slide, and it's called red thread. And red thread is a very common disease of a couple of different plant, or a couple of different uh, turf grass species. And when it is growing actively, it's usually first thing in the morning when you get an opportunity to see the signs of red thread. Now you'll see the symptoms later in the day of the brown patch of dead grass in the, in the, in the lawn, but in the morning, that mycelium is growing very active. And it'll come in two different forms. One form, when you look low into the, um, the turf grass, you'll see these little cotton balls down in there. It almost looks like cotton candy and it has a little bit of a pinkish color to it. And the other thing is the stems of the turf grass, out the very tips of those stems, where it's been cut off by the lawnmower, you'll see these tentacle-like structures coming out that are a very pinkish red color. Thus, it's called red thread, threads of pinkish red material. Um, so those are the mycelial parts that we can see because there's lots of them growing in the same spot. Otherwise, we're gonna see the symptoms. And, and the symptoms are gonna be mottling, dwarfing, distortion, discoloration, wilting, shriveling, leaf drop, um, and the list goes on and on <coughs> as to what symptoms may be. All right, so signs. Well, there's that cedar apple rust, uh, once again, on eastern red cedar. There's powdery mildew on oak leaves. Mm -hmm. There's another type of fungus, and this fungus is actually called chicken of the woods. Mm -hmm. And anybody who harvests or forages for mushrooms would look at that and say, that's a delightful thing to collect and eat. No, well, that's the know. reproductive structure of chicken of the woods. It's a wood decaying fungus. So when you see a growth like that on the exterior of an oak tree, an ash tree, uh, a honey locust tree, that's not a good thing to see. Because that is an indicator that there's rot occurring in the trunk of that tree. Now it does grow frequently on dead wood, you know, logs that are down, trees that are already dead, but it also grows on the trunk of living trees. And when it's growing on the trunk of a living tree, it's causing wood decay in the trunk. Here's that red thread. And so now you can see those red threads coming out the, the tips of the cutoff stem. And there's quite a bit of it there. 
So, um, symptoms of damage, plant tissue, and, and again, that's just re-emphasizing all the different terminology that we use to describe symptoms. Leaf scorch, so there's gonna be a part of the leaf that's dried up and brown and ready to fall apart. Specks and spots. Specks are tiny, spots are a, bit, a little bit bigger. Lesions, now lesions are a description of specks and spots. A speck in a spot is a lesion. You can have blotches that are big lesions. Um, we go from there to tick lice. Well, that's when the terminal growth on a branch or at the top of the plant is dead and dying. So that would be a tick lice. Cankers, uh, there, there are all kinds of cankers that we describe from different diseases. Um, some of them are sunken cankers. Some of them are raised cankers. Some of them are dry cankers, some of them are weeping cankers, and you can use all those terms collectively, saying you have a sunken weeping canker on that particular tree. It might be a stem canker, it might be a branch canker, it might be a trunk canker. Um, so canker is a very broad term. Galls, we've already seen an example of a gall. Wilts, just as the term implies, all the foliage in the plant is gonna wilt, and usually that's because water is no longer getting to those parts of the plant. And that might be due to a vascular disease or it might be due to a root rot that's resulting in a wilt. A shepherd's crook. We all know what a shepherd's crook looks like. It's a cane with a hook on the end of it. Well, in some diseases, they very characteristically produce shepherd's crooks on the terminal growth of the plant. And the most notorious of those is the uh, fire blight of rosaceae. That's a bacterial disease. And that's a disease that is limited to the rosaceae. If you see a shepherd's crook on another plant that is not a rose plant, it's not bacterial. It's not bacterial fire blight. Uh, rots, well, it, it, that's pretty obvious. Fruit rots, you know, butt rot, root rot, wet rot, dry rots. Um, and there's more rots out there than you can imagine. Uh, and so it's all, again, descriptions of either where the rot is occurring on the fruit, uh, butt rot, that's the butt of a tree. It's not an animal butt. That's a tree butt that we're talking about there. Uh, root rot, pretty obvious. Wet rots, it's gonna be very moist. Uh, dry rots, um, that's, there are certain fungi that grow in relatively dry environments. And um, the best example of it is there is dry rot of lumber. And it's very characteristic. When lumber is, is impacted by this type of fungus, it becomes cuboidal um, and rusty color. And it very easily crumbles because of the digestion that the fungus has produced. Again, symptoms. Um, this is a, unfortunately a very, very common symptom that we see on that particular plant. Anybody know what that plant is? Pine. It's a pine. Yes. Yeah. And I give you credit for calling it a pine. It's not a spruce, right? I think so. Ah. Doesn't look. How do you tell the difference between a spruce tree and a pine tree? Color, I would say. Yeah, not color. We'll throw that one out. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Now, cones, if you know what the cones look like, you can separate pines from spruces because pines have pine cones and spruces have spruce cones. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Being facetious, aren't you? <laughs> but you can tell the difference between a pine cone and a spruce cone because a pine cone, the scales of the cone are relatively heavy and relatively few compared to a spruce cone where the scales are almost paper thin, mm -hmm. and there's many more of them. Um, but um, the other way of telling the difference between a pine and a spruce is the number of needles that connect together to the branch. Mm -hmm. Pines, their <coughs> needles come in bundles of two, three, or five. Spruce. The needles are all connected singularly to the branch. So this is a pine. And specifically, this is Austrian 
And if you know your Austrian pines, they're the ones that are looking like trash out there in the landscape and dying usually from the bottom up. And the causative agent that produces the symptom that we're seeing there is the Plodia tip blight. Right? The Plodia tip blight. The Plodia is the genus of the fungus. Tip, it's infecting the new candles, the tips of the branches. <coughs> and it's called blight because it's killing it. Now that the Plodia tip blight will transgress down into the branch and slowly kill that branch back into the trunk of the tree. It's a progressive disease. It will take years to completely consume an Austrian pine, but it will kill it. And there's not a whole lot you can do about it. There's a weeping canker. And it's on Scott's pine. And this is also diplodium. In this case, diplodia causes tip blight, but when it infects deep into the branches, it's called a canker. And it, and it produces a weeping canker. So the, the response of the pine tree to that infection is trying, is, uh, and I gotta be careful of saying it's not trying, it's its physiological response to the infection. The, the uh, resin is being blown out through the vascular tissue, trying to dislodge the disease out of the plant. And that's why you get this weeping appearance in the canker where the fungus is infected. There's an example of a shepherd's crook. And so what had occurred is the bacteria for bacterial fire blight. You have any idea how it gets into the plant? Wind. Nope. This time it's not wind. Wound. Wound. No, it's not like through a wound. wound. No, honey. it's not through a wound either. It's honeybees. Oh. <clears throat> honeybees pollinating the flowers. Bacterial fire blight is a springtime disease. And uh, it overwinters in the plant tissue of the previously infected plants. In the springtime, the cankers that are produced by bacterial fire blight start generating an oozy material out to the surface of the plant. Well, when the pollinators, such as honeybees, come to the plant, they might walk through that canker and pick up the bacteria on their feet. And why are they there at the tree in the first place? They're there for the blossoms to pollinate, collect nectar, collect pollen, and do the pollination. When they land with the bacterial covered feet, it introduces the fire blight into the blossom. Once the bacteria establishes in the blossom, it starts transferring down through the stem of the, the flower into the terminal spur of the flower, into the branch of the tree. And once it girdles a portion of the branch down here toward the base, it kills everything from that point outwards. There you can see the different blossoms that have been killed by the bacterial fire blight in the image. And then once it kills that new growth, it wilts over and produces a shepherd's crook. So you can tell it's an apple based on the, fl the flower stems that are left there, as well as the shape of the leaves. And that is, when it's in rosaceae, it's definitely bacterial fire blight. So this is another aspect of plant pathogen. You have to understand it, its life cycle. When does it spread? When can it be picked up? When, do, when is it initiated in the host plant? Um, and if, if you know that disease cycle of the pathogen, you have an opportunity to interfere with that progression of the disease. Um, this is a leaf drop, uh, and it's one that we probably won't see ever again, because this is the result of ash and thracnose. Why do I say we're probably not going to see much of this ever again? Most of our ash trees were wiped out by emerald ash borer. Uh, but it was, at one time, one of the most common foliage diseases 
of ash tree, mm -hmm. and it infected the leaves only when those leaves were newly expanded. Mm -hmm. So it's a springtime disease. It's a fungal disease. It produces a lesion on the leaf, and that lesion, de depending on how big it got, if it was too big, physiologically, the plant perceived it wasn't doing its function, so let's recycle the nutrients out of it and drop it and get it off the tree. It looks spectacular to see that many leaves dropping out of a tree in springtime, mm -hmm. but it was actually relatively insignificant because okay, so there was many, many thousands and more leaves up in the tree than what actually <coughs> were falling on the car. Um, but um, it only occurred in the springtime. Once the leaves were hardened and things warmed up later into spring, no more ash and brachnose disease. Uh, here's scab. Um, this is apple scab. This is an orchard apple tree. And those lesions kind of look like a scabby surface on the, the surface of the leaf. Um, here's a blotch. Uh, and this is specifically of chestnut and buckeye. And um, it, the symptomology of that blotch, it's a leaf blotch, uh, that says that it's disease and not just environmental is that halo of yellow around the blotch. Uh, and that's the name of that disease is Gignardia, Gignardia leaf blotch of Esculus. And that's the genus of horse chestnuts and buckeyes. So how do we go about identifying plant <coughs> pathogens and other problems in the field. Um, the disease identification, we have a fact sheet, in fact it's part of your Master Gardener manual, um, called the 20 Questions of Diagnostics. Now this was a conceptualization put together by a number of extension educators that do diagnostics all the time. They sat down and they really thought through the process of what kind of questions does one need to ask about the situation you're dealing with that can potentially lead to an identification of the plant problem. And they came up with 20 questions. Now, first thing I will tell you, you do not have to ask all 20 of those questions every time you do a diagnostics, because sometimes the diagnostic is incredibly simple. Well, that's that walk away. Um, because it's so common, we expect it all the time on that particular plant. Um, the symptom, symptoms match what we expect to see for that disease. You know, we're done. But others may require um, greater investigation. Of those 20 questions, the first three are probably the most significant ones you should absolutely get an answer for. The first three. It has nothing to do with the pathogen. The first question is, what is the, the plant that you're dealing with? If you can't identify the plant, you're never going to get a proper answer for what's wrong with that plant. So you need to know what it is. You know, is it a sycamore? Is it a maple? Is it an iris? Is it a peony? Is it a, a phlox plant? Is it whatever it is? You've got to get a good name, a proper name, to what that plant is. Otherwise, you're just shooting blanks into the wind because you're going to be lost. Second, once you know what the host plant is that you're working with, you can very easily find out what are the common and most key pests of that plant, whether it's insect pests uh, or disease causing pests, whatever it may be, you can find lists out there for particular host species that says the most common problems with this plant are this, 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 and this. And that will give you a head start on figuring out what you might be dealing with. The other thing is, by knowing what that plant is, um, you also may know what are the unusual appearances of that plant to begin with. Now, there are a number of plant selections, especially in ornamental landscapes, that have what appears to be something wrong with them, such as an evergreen. What color do you expect an evergreen to be? Green. 
okay? That was not, not a crap question. Um, but even amongst the evergreen <coughs> plants, we have selections that are golden. So there's our variety, the golden arborvitae. It is gold in color. And if you're expecting your evergreen to be green and you have a yellow one, you might think something's wrong with it, unless you know that's why that plant was bought, because of it's selected for that yellow color. There are evergreens that have white on them. Um, some of them are variegations. Some of them are, um, for example, anybody ever see a, a dragon eye pine? A dragon eye pine. When you look at the needles of a dragon eye pine, there will be yellowish white, green, yellowish white, green, yellowish white bands out the needles. And it's called dragon's eye pine because when you take that branch and turn it directly to you and look straight down the length of that branch, it will look like an eye and an iris. Because it will have a complete ring of green a complete ring of yellow, white, another complete green, um, and so you get these concentric rings that color going out the needles. Are there some around here that we could look at? Well, potentially. Um, Arboreta usually have a, an example of one, so if you know where your different plant uh, gardens are, such as Toledo Botanical Garden, or Dawes Arboretum, or um, there, there's a, a really nice hidden Arboreta Garden up in, I think it's Gilboa? No, not Gilboa. It, it's in Ottawa County or Lucas County, um, and, and it's out in the middle of the country all by itself. I can't, can't think of, of the name of it right now. Shadell? Um, it could be the name of it. Look, look up Gardens of Ohio on the internet, and you will find all kinds of hidden gardens all over the place that are open to the public. Um, down in Dayton, Cox Arboretum. Down in Cincinnati, um, there's a cemetery. There's a huge cemetery that has spectacular collections of plants in it. Um, the Cincinnati Zoo. It's a botanical garden as well as it is a zoo. Toledo. Toledo Zoo is a botanical garden as well as a zoo. So there's lots of different places that you can see these things. All right, so um, where do you get these answers to these questions? Well, you can have a reference library. Uh, uh, you can use the internet. Uh, or the other place to get help. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, before I run to there, does anybody know what that tree is? Is it sycamore? Yeah, it's an American sycamore. Yeah. And this is a springtime picture. And notice all the other trees in the background. They all have foliage on them. Why is my sycamore looking like it's dead? Because it's springtime? No, it's not. It's a late bloomer. I'm sorry? Is it a late? No, it's not a late. In fact, it's a very early flusher of leaves. In fact, it probably flushed its first group of leaves before all of these background trees had their first leaves expanded. It's sick. Well, kind of. Um, and uh, in this, it, here's another image of American sycamores in a, in a wood lump. All the other trees are, are completely foliated, <coughs> but the American sycamores are naked. And that's because of sycamore anthracnose. Mm -hmm. It's a fungal disease of newly expanding foliage in the springtime. And many years, it is completely wiping out the entire first flush of leaves on the American sycamore, making them look like they're way behind everybody else. And then by June, it will have reflushed a new set of leaves and it will look like absolutely nothing as well. Except when it loses those leaves, notice how so many of these branches seem to be abruptly stopped in their progression of growing outward from the tree. And you know, later, I'll probably have another picture of this. At the ends of those branches, there will be a dead stub and a prol proliferation of branches coming out of that point. <coughs> and it's called a witch's broom. Mm 
and why it's called that. Now, you can see a Halloween witch's broom and it looks like a bunch of sticks kind of gnarly going in all kinds of directions. Well, that's what this is kind of describing on the American sycamore as well, a witch's broom at the ends of the branches. And what has happened, that anthracnose not only kills the leaves, but it will go down through the petiole of the leaf, down into the branch that that leaf was growing from, and kill the branch back to a node. And so you'll get a dead section of a branch at the, term, the terminus of the branch, which will fall off, and then that next node back, all the buds around that node get released to grow, giving you that bunchy appearance of sticks all coming out from the same spot. But how do I know that? Because I know American sycamore. And I know the most prominent disease of American sycamore is leaf anthracnose, sycamore anthracnose. And I can guarantee, almost guarantee nine out of 10 years you will see this appearance to American sycamore. So do we not treat it much no. since there's so many of them? Well, there's two big problems here. And one big problem is the size of that sycamore. They're huge, especially mature ones. Um, and it would take a fun fungal fungicide spray. Nobody has equipment to reach that high up in the tree. And the other thing with these sprays, they have to be on the tree before the disease gets there. Mm -hmm. And timing would be the critical thing. And to time it perfectly is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. So, no, nobody's gonna do that. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a fact of life. Mm -hmm. So, where else can you go to get help? Well, the C-W-E-P-T-E-C. You don't know what that is? Shame on you. C. Wayne Elliott Plant and Pesticide Diagnostic yes. Center. That's why I don't like your handouts. <laughs> that is our. That is our. the handout. That is our diagnostic oh. clinic through the university. Um, C. Wayne Elliott um, was the faculty member that initiated the plant diagnostic clinic, um, and we, as extension personnel. Um, as well as the public can collect samples and send to the clinic and say, for a fee, ask what they think the problem is on that. They do insect identifications and they do disease identifications with limitations. And the, and the big limitation is how well you took the sample. Um, we, we used to have a, a leader of this diagnostic clinic, Nancy Taylor, and uh, we have a, a team in extension called the Buckeye Environmental Horticulture Team, and she was part of that team, and, as well as I am, and we would have a weekly phone call where we discuss things that we see in the field. And one of Nancy's laments was, well, I received five boxes of br dead brown sticks this week. <laughs> can't do anything with a dead brown stick so um, the samples are very critical as to how good of an answer you get back from the clinic and when you go to their website which is the ppdc.osu.edu um, they have instructions as to how you take samples appropriately um, the other thing is you have to send those samples at the beginning of the week <coughs> You don't want to send them on Friday because <coughs> they're going to sit in the mail room somewhere mm -hmm. or they're going to sit in the mail truck somewhere. And by the time it, it gets distributed to the clinic on Monday morning, it's, it's a box dead. of dead brown sticks <laughs> or dried up leaves. Or if, the, if it were fresh leaves on Friday, it's probably mold covered leaves on Monday. So you don't send your sample on Friday. The earlier in the week that you send your sample, the better the results are going to be. All right, there's the, <coughs> the weather graph again. All right, so what can they do that we can't do in the field? Well, they can do all kinds of laboratory procedures to verify what might be killing the plant. And one of them is the, the isolation process um, that they can go through in the lab. And that isolation process, you get the infected plant or some portion of it, 
Now when you take samples out of it, notice where they're taking samples. There's that leaf lesion there. And the sample is partially in good tissue and partially in infected tissue because most of your disease-causing organisms are going to be in that transitional zone between the two. That's why you can't send dead brown sticks because there's no transition zone. Um, they can put it on media, they can grow it on the media for a period of time. Um, once they get it growing on the media, then they can transfer it to another plant of the same type that isn't infected and verify that it can infect the plant. How long does that take? Well, you're not going to get your sample answered overnight. It may be a couple of weeks before they can work their way through that kind of laboratory procedure. Um, here's bacteria, um, and this is a petri plate, and on the petri plate or in it are different types of media that are specific to different types of organisms. So that's why this one over here has three different colored areas in it. Each one of those areas is, is a different media that supports different organisms. And based on where that organism grows or doesn't grow, will help eliminate what it is or isn't in a laboratory. Can't do this in the field, but the laboratory can. And it does take time. So if you're ever working with a client that wants a sample sent to the clinic, be, be sure to make them aware that they're not gonna get an answer overnight. It may be a couple of weeks before you get an affirmative answer one way or the other. Now if it's an insect, that's much easier. Uh, we usually can get a turnaround, or I can get a turnaround on an insect identification within an hour or so of getting it. Um, even a picture of an insect, I've done many identifications that way. But when it comes to plant diseases, it's a tougher row to hoe, um, simply because of all the different steps one has to go through to verify what you have. <coughs> all right, so why don't we take a little bit of a break here, uh, get up and stretch, use the restroom, get something to drink, whatever, and we'll come back and look at some significant diseases of plants through history impacts on human populations. You know, well, the, the uh, rye plants that you see over here, you see those black structures growing out of the head. That's usually where the rye seed is supposed to be growing on the head of this grass plant. There is a fungus called ergot. And ergot infects the kernels in the heads <coughs> of rye, as well as some of the other small grains, wheat and barley, etc. But rye is really susceptible to it. And one of the potential reasons that um, the Salem witch trials may have been carried out <laughs> is from ergotism, where um, the ergot, that fungus, actually produces a chemical that is incredibly close to LSD. Ooh. And if you eat enough of it, <laughs> you could have hallucinations. <laughs> So you might see your neighbors jumping off their roof and flying on a broom from one place to another, uh, taking a little trip and they are leaving the farm because you're eating an LSD-like compound. Um, and uh, the, the thing is, in those New England uh, you know, states where they were colonizing, um, the environment at that time was very cool, very wet, which both of these favor ergotism. Um, it also um, resulted in rye being the choice of grains because the other grains did not grow well under those cool, wet conditions. And so they had a couple of years where ergot was huge in their crops. And they still made their bread out of it because you can't really separate that out <coughs> from the rest of the grain. Um, so that's a potential. Um, uh, bounty mildew almost resulted in the entire destruction of the wine industry in France. Um, and uh, it also uh, partially brought out, brought it to the forefront the development of one of the first fungicides. Now that, that's kind of a, a dual story there. Um, in France, all the vineyards go right down to the edge of the county roads, country roads, where the grapes are being grown. Yeah. So how long ago was this? Oh, that was uh, in the 
Uh, I'm not going to quote the date, but it was hundreds of years ago. Okay, okay. It wasn't just recent, okay. hundreds of years ago. Hundreds of years ago. Okay. Um, and uh, so passers-by down the country roads were notorious for snitching the grapes off the ends of the vineyards. Uh, the they them. They were eating them, yes. They were heisting them, buy finger discount, whatever you want to call it. Um, but they were taken away from part of the crop of the vineyards, and so they didn't like that. So they, one guy decided he was going to develop a mixture to spray on the ends of those vineyards to prevent people from wanting to eat the grapes. And so he had a mixture of lime and some other chemicals that he mixed together and sprayed all over the ends of those vineyard rows that made the, the grapes taste very bitter so that people would let them alone. So, as a side effect, all of those ends of the rows that were sprayed with this mixture had next to zero disease on them compared to the rest of the vineyard. And it's called today Bordeaux's mixture. So it was one of the very first fungicides that was ever developed. And that was by chance an accidental development because they were trying to cut down on snitching out of the vineyard. But it turned out to be an excellent fungicide at the same time. Mass starvation and migration out of Ireland because of the great Irish potato famine. That's why nearly a quarter of the people in the United States have Irish heritage to them. It's because of the Irish potato famine, um, which was caused by, actually it's a water mold, um, a late blight of potatoes. And the water mold is a Phytophthora. Phytophthora infestans. Uh, have you heard Phytophthora? before? Well, in this soybean producing area, you've most likely heard of Phytophthora soybean, Phytophthora root rot, Phytophthora stem rot. Um, it's another water mold that's closely related to <coughs> the water mold that causes late blight in potatoes and tomatoes. Um, and the bizarre thing is, this is part of the reason that the Irish absolutely hate the English. <laughs> because the Irish were growing wheat for the English, and they were growing potatoes to feed themselves. When this water mold set in and absolutely decimated the potato crop, they were not allowed to eat the wheat. And they still had to ship all their wheat to England. So there they are growing this luxurious, wheat crop for England and weren't permitted to eat it. And they were starving to death because of their crop that they ate was being destroyed by late blight. Mm -hmm. and, and an Irishman would eat about five pounds of potatoes daily mm -hmm. as his main subsistence. Wow. So over a, a million and a half people died of starvation in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And another million or so migrated to the United States and other countries throughout the world. Why couldn't they just eat it and not kill anybody? Yeah. There were too many agents that were constantly observing the crops and they knew how much needed to go to England. So, it's no wonder they hate the English mm -hmm. because of the way they were treated <laughs> in that particular case. American chestnut blight, a fungal disease of the American chestnut tree. Uh, most of you probably never seen a, a natural growth of American chestnut. Um, we still get a few that grow here and there from the stumps that used to be there. And it used to be the number one lumber log in eastern United States. Mm -hmm. When late blight came, or when fungal blight came and, and nailed the chestnut, it wiped out numerous lumber businesses here in the eastern United States. Um, it, it was devastating. And still is. American elms and Dutch elm disease. This is a fungal disease of the American elm tree, which wiped out just about every American elm tree that existed in towns, villages, and cities. It used to be that our streets were lined with this magnificent canopy of American elm trees. And many of us were at the, around at the time when that hit. 1960, wasn't it? 
and it's in the 60s, mm -hmm. where it just decimated them. Mm -hmm. And it completely changed the, um, the landscape in most cities, towns, and villages. Mm -hmm. That's when we got the silver maple tree. Mm -hmm. The ugly, dirty dog of a tree <laughs> that should never be used as a street tree. It can be a magnificent tree out in the open, but in that little street lawn that they expect it to grow in, mm, it's a real garbage tree. Now, we still have American elm. It still grows naturally in every woodlot throughout Ohio. However, they get to about the age of 20, 25 years, and the change occurs in their physio physiology on the interior, and they go from being tolerant to completely susceptible, and they die out. Now, there's still an American elm tree that I watch every year between Kenton and Ada. Growing out in the country, and it's about a, you know, maybe a quarter of a mile north of 309. I see it every day. It's a majestic. It is very tall, nice when I, V shape. When I hardy. walk, it's right over here, my line of sight, and it looks at me and says, "I don't care what windstorm comes, <laughs> I'm here." Um, and, and we have these survivor trees all over the place. Some a high, of these big ones. A high Northern University does studies on it. Ohio Northern? Yes. My wife is a faculty member there, and I'm not aware of anybody studying Um, it. I think it's uh, Terry Kaiser. The Terry Kaiser? Kaiser, yeah. Yeah, well, I'd be a little suspect about what he's studying there. But, uh, <laughs> but they, they, they watch it. They watch it. <laughs> yeah. But it is one of the original ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's still some big ones around. Yeah. But uh, most of the really big ones have been decimated. It's in the tree. It's right very long the tree, time ago. Right. Um, sudden oak death in oak is really another phytophthora disease, and fortunately um, we haven't really detected it here in Ohio yet, but it is out on the, east, the west coast. And the problem with this is um, it, it's phytophthora lamorans. Um, it can also infect rhododendrons and azaleas. And there's huge amounts of nursery production that occur in Washington State and Oregon State, and they get shipped to the east. So it's a real concern that it might get introduced via that nursery cell. Um, Asian soybean rust, this is a rust disease specific to soybean plants. Um, about what, 15 years ago, we were just all in the dither thinking that we were going to get hammered with soybean rust. And it's never shown up in Ohio or it's only shown up in the very southern parts of Ohio and never spread further into the state. So we were lucky based, for some reason, it never makes it up here. In, in South America, it devastates the soybean crop and they have to spend a lot of fungicide money to control it down there. Um, so uh, there's, there's uh, what is this? Oh, that's late blight in potato here. Um, so it does have a foliar um, a blotch that it produces. It can also infect tomato plants. Um, and then that's what the potato looks like if it's infested with that late blight as well. So um, there's nothing harvestable there, nothing edible there. And if your entire potato crop looks like that in a few days, you're done. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, well, the ergotism in St. Anthony's fire, this is another symptomology that goes along with ergot in grain. Um, it was a, a big problem in the Middle Ages. And what occurred there, another chemical besides the LSD-like compound uh, that's put off by that particular ergot fungus uh, <coughs> caused a, a constriction in the vascular <laughs> tissue to the point that it would cut off circulation to the extremities of the body. Uh, and a person would literally die from the tips of their body back into the core of the body. And it would develop into a gangrene because of lack of circulation. It's called St. Anthony's fire because it, it impacted the nerves to the point that it felt like the skin was on fire. So St. Anthony's fire. Um, some diseases have been mistaken for new plants of all things. How many of you have tulips that have streaks of white and streaks of color in the flower? That's called a broken tulip. And the reason that it's there is because the tulip bulb is infected with a virus. 
again, back in uh, the 1500s and 1600s in Europe, the, the elite, the royalists, the noblest, they went tulip crazy to the point that they would pay thousands of dollars for a single tulip bulb. Now, the peasants didn't do that, but the, the rich did. Uh, and when these broken tulips showed up in a, in a production area, they were paying exorbitant amounts of money for a diseased tulip bulb. So it's kind of ironic, uh, but again, serves me right. Um, <laughs> numerous crop diseases that impact our crop production on an annual basis throughout the world. Greater than 15% of all U.S. crops are decimated by fungal and bacterial diseases and reducing production annually by 15% from its potential. Um, I already talked about Phytophthora root rot and stem rot in soybeans. That's one of the, we are in the Phytophthora capital of the world here in Northwest Ohio. It is our, our most significant disease of soybeans. Um, now, you know, our new soybean pathologists might argue with that a little bit uh, because we have another disease that hits soybean called soybean cyst nematode which is kind of the hidden disease that robs from our crop. Uh, plant diseases can be very difficult to control. That's our other challenge. Uh, and the reasoning behind that, let's see, there's our broken tulip there. Um, there's air got mixed in with the wheat grain, is our fungicides. The vast majority of our fungicides, the chemicals that we have to manage fungal diseases, there's a couple things going on there. Um, some of these chemicals are relatively old and they've been used over and over and over again. So there's a lot of resistance that has developed to some of our fungicides. The other aspect of our fungicides, most of them up until relatively recently are preventative, meaning that they have to be in place before the disease ever gets there. So we have to anticipate that we could run into a disease problem. And then once you spray it out in the field, it only lasts for seven to 10 days once you apply it. So if your anticipation of the disease doesn't occur in that seven to 10 day period, you've just wasted your fungicide. Or if the weather conditions change around and it becomes really dry, most of your diseases aren't going to develop. Um, so uh, that's a, a big challenge there. Now, we do have some newer types of fungicides coming into availability, things like strobilurins that are systemic fungicides, meaning you can either apply them to the plant, to the foliage, or apply them to the soil, and they're taken up into the plant, and the plants are protected from the inside out. And they can be slightly curative. Does, does OSU like have all the modeling systems for fungicide application? Like, is there like an orchard application and then a Well, we a certainly have a lot of bulletins that will help figure out when different products should be applied, anticipating okay. certain diseases. But I didn't know if it had like the one, because when I worked out in uh, West Virginia and Eastern Panhandle, like that whole area, you know, Winchester, Virginia, whatever, they actually had, like, the Quad State actually had a program, it was basically <coughs> sent it out to, like, all the orchardists and everything. Oh, okay. That, like, gave, gave, I, I didn't know if those, you had, had that or not. We used to have four integrated pest management programs where we had scouts that would go out in the field and advise producers when and when they shouldn't use products. Um, but most of those, after they were developed for a number of years, the administration at the university says, now it's a, it's, it's a set thing. Now pass that off to commercial companies to take it over. Um, and the, the biggest challenge with IFPM programs, where you have a scout that goes out on a regular basis and um, into your orchard, into your vegetables, into your field crops, Many times they come back with, nothing's there, you don't have to do anything, now pay me for being out in the field. Right. And th that's a hard sell. After a few years of saying, nope, you don't, nope, 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 but still pay me, a lot of orchardists and others said, no, I'm not gonna do this anymore. Even though it was benefiting them in the long run, 
they weren't seeing them. I just meant for like the scab, you know, like the initial scab preventatives and all that. Yeah, well, and, and it, eventually that just gets down to, um, we do have charts of saying where the development of your trees are. Okay. You should start doing this at this time, this, that, that. Not just on a calendar basis of it's April 1, get out there and pray. Right. It's more based on the development of the plant, where it is in its development, because right. that can vary from year to year. Yes, we have that kind of information. Um, let's see, weather plays a major, major role, and so weather is incredibly unpredictable for anything, for any of our crops. Um, and you know, w when it comes down to managing your field crops, um, what is 50% of our variability of ability to produce the crop? It's weather. And we just can't predict it, predict it accurately enough, consistently enough, to be able to tell you otherwise. And we can't control it, thank God. Uh, we'd really screw it up if we could. Um, a lot of the inoculum that starts the disease is microscopic, as you, so you can never tell when it actually gets it. You know, you're only assuming that it's getting there. Um, you can't see it. And then, even once it gets there, there is a delay between when it gets there and when you start seeing symptoms of the disease. So that's a, a, a problem. Pa a number of our pathogens, whether they're viral, bacterial, or fungal, they mutate incredibly rapidly. So once we get a handle on it in one form, by the time we get that inflammation out, it's muta mutated to a different form. Because so like with that Phytophthora, Phytophthora <coughs> soybeans, now we have plant breeders that are constantly breeding new resistance into our soybean plants to fend off Phytophthora, uh, the glycines, which is the, the uh, uh, Phytophthora root rot and stem rot. By the time we get that bred into the soybean plants, it's already mutated onto a new variety. And so we're always a little bit behind the eight ball, or we get about three or four years out of that resistance and it's broken. And, and we are, and when we depend on signs and symptoms, they show up very late in the development, which brings us to the de disease cycle. How a disease develops in a plant. And there's four stages to that. Inoculation, incubation, penetration, infection, and then we see symptoms. And from the time of inoculation, in other words, a spore getting to the plant and landing on it, and when we see symptoms, maybe two to three weeks have passed. So by the time you see symptoms and are ready to react to that infection, that infection's already well established in the plant. As I mentioned earlier, with our fungicides, they're preventative, not curative. So how do we deal with that? If we, have, if we know that by the time we see symptoms, we're already behind the eight ball. <coughs> How do we uh, balance that out? Do we use a fungicide at that point, or do we just give up and say, well, have at it, we'll see you next year? Um, and the answer to that is partially depends on what plant you're dealing with. The other part of that answer is, you're not gonna cure the symptoms that you see there. And, and, that, and that's a mistake of a lot of homeowners. They see a symptom, they rush out to Walmart, they grab the bottle that says the fungicide, they go back and spray it on their plants, and the symptoms are still there. They always will be, because you can't cure those symptoms. What you will do is protect new growth from that. So the, the expectation of the homeowner is, I can spray this on this plant and it's gonna become healthy all of a sudden. That's not, in reality, how it works. Um, so that's, that's something we have to train our, our customers to. You're never going to get rid of that symptom that's already there. The only thing that you're gonna do is try to protect the new foliage that may come on afterwards. All right. Um, so in, in this uh, inoculation, inoculation is just a, a fancy way of saying the disease has gotten to the plant. Uh, incubation, it has to germinate, it has to start growing 
um, before it even infests the plant. So it's, it's doing that on the surface of the plant. Penetration, <coughs> now this is an example of penetration over here, uh, where it's showing this was a spore, it germinated and grew for a period over the surface of the plant. Now it has penetrated through the epidermis of the plant into the active growing cells underneath and then it has to grow into those cells where it's going to harvest whatever it needs for its growth and development. So that's the penetration, getting through that protective layer on the surface of the leaf. And then the infection stage is where it's actually growing into the living cells of the host and beginning to kill those cells due to stealing from them. And that's when we start seeing symptoms. So that's the disease cycle. The other thing that we want to emphasize when it comes to disease management is the disease triangle. And that disease triangle includes one leg of that triangle being the pathogen, one leg of that triangle being the susceptible host, and one leg of that triangle being the environment. And we'll the reason that we have to in, uh, emphasize the environment is that pathogen is still a living organism itself. The host is a living organism. Both of those organisms need specific things from the environment for it to grow and thrive well. And so keeping that in mind, you have two living organisms and the environment that you can work with, you can start developing a management plan for these plant pathogens. So there's the depiction of the disease triangle. Each leg of that triangle has either the environment, the host, or the pathogen. Now, if we want to manage to prevent a disease from developing, we need to kick one of those legs out of that triangle. And that means we either manipulate the host, we manipulate the pathogen, or we manipulate the environment to make it less conducive for the pathogen. So the pathogen, again, it's a biological organism. It's going to have requirements from the host and from the environment. It has to have a means of overwintering. It has to have a means of dispersing to get from one host to another host. And so there's, there's uh, susceptible areas in its life that can be potentially manipulated. How do pathogens get dispersed? How do they get moved around from one place to another? Depending on the pathogen, it can have all kinds of potential mechanisms to get from point A to point B. A lot of our fungi produce spores, and these are tiny microscopic spores, very light, very dry, and they can be picked up by the wind and dispersed long distances on the wind, which is kind of defeating <coughs> when you start thinking about it. You can do everything you want to in your own <laughs> landscape, and yet these pathogens could be coming from miles up the road and blowing into your landscape. Um, so it's, it's kind of a vicious cycle, but as long as you're aware of that. Some of the spores get <laughs> mixed with water, such as, you know, here's a, a tanker that's developing spores, and instead of blowing those spores on the wind, it mixes with water and runs down the length of the plant. Now, once it's mixed in water, then it can be picked up by all kinds of other things and moved around. Wind and water at the same time. Insects, we've already mentioned uh, bacterial fire blight being spread by insects. Irrigation water or flooding water can pick up disease and carry it to new locations. You've got to be careful of where your seeds are being sourced. You know, if you're buying seeds from a reputable company like Berkey Seed Supply, they're going to have pretty clean seed. But if you're buying seed from somebody who's simply um, saving seeds from their own garden, drying them out, and then passing them on to neighbors or friends or selling them at a flea market, you have no idea what's going on with that, that kind of seed. So you could be buying disease seed from there. Um, clubs, trans <coughs> transplants. A lot of the vegetables and other, you know, even uh, annual plants 
they're being grown down south someplace in a greenhouse and then shipped north here in the springtime. And then we go buy them at Menards, Lowe's, Walmart, you name it, wherever they're being sold. And if we're not careful, some of those plugs could be infected with a disease or even an insect or a mite from down south. So that's another way that they can vector disease. Um, wild animals going through a production area. Um, them just passing through plants can get stuff on their fur and transfer it to new areas. The farmer themselves or the gardener themselves, they can get it on their boots, they can get it on their clothing, they can get it on their tools that they work with, tractors that they use. Um, anything that can pick up soil and carry it on to a different location could potentially spread a disease. How do they overwinter? Depends on the disease organism that you're looking at as to how they can overwinter. Now, a lot of it can overwinter in plant refuse, plants from the previous years that is left as residue on the surface of the soil. Now, sanitation goes a huge distance for managing a lot of diseases. Clean up that plant residue, <coughs> compost it, burn it, get it off site. Um, you can eliminate some of that inoculum. Um, when it comes to trees and shrubs, you can have all kinds of cankers and other things on those diseased trees. Um, once again, uh, seed, they can overwinter in seed. Uh, seed potatoes, onion sets, um, inspect them carefully when you buy them. If there's any ugly looking lesions or bad looking spots on them, don't plant them because you could be potentially planting diseases. And then some diseases overwinter in insects. So the insect overwinters someplace and when they come back out in the spring, they already have the disease inside of them and can spread them to your plant. So there's all kinds of ways that diseases overwinter. There's all kinds of ways that diseases can be dispersed from one place to another. And then the next thing is how do these organisms get into the plants themselves once they get there? Um, and there's several different ways that that can occur. We've already seen in that previous disease cycle um, slide where when some fungi germinate, they grow across the leaf surface and then they have a special mycelia, a special type of hyphae that secretes enzymes onto the surface of the plant that eat a hole through that leaf surface. And once they penetrate that way, they're inside of the plant. There are natural openings on plants, on the leaves, called stomata. And that's where gas exchange occurs on the leaves. When they are open, transferring gases, things like fungi as well as bacteria can enter through the stomata. And um, a number of plants, if you've ever looked at something like a coleus plant, first thing in the morning, and look at the edge of the leaf, there'll be this, this series of very beautiful droplets around the edge of the leaf. Those water droplets will eventually, as the plant begins to warm up, get sucked back into the plant through, through holes called hydathodes. And if something gets in that water droplet while it's out, when it gets sucked back into the plant, it carries it right back into the plant with it. And one of the worst um, methods by which in plants get infected is wounding. Wounding of any sort. Physical wounds from equipment bumping up against your plants. Pruning equipment and cutting wounds. Um, hail storms, hail st stones can damage plant tissue severely. Um, so any physical impaction on the plant that opens up a wound is a potential site of infection. So we have to guard our plants as well as we can against unnecessary damage to them. Um, which means if you have a teenager running your lawnmower and your weed whip, <laughs> you gotta watch them like a hawk. Uh, because they find it very entertaining to take that weed whip right up the trunk of the tree mm -hmm. um, just to see what it will do to the leaves of the tree. All right, so um, disease triangle and management of disease. Uh, how can we manage the host? What could we do to favor the host so that it isn't 
uh, available for a, a disease to infect it. Um, plant pathogens that might infect the, the host is probably always out there. Uh, factors that influence how well the host can fend off a disease, um, we're talking susceptibility <coughs> to resistance. And it goes susceptible, tolerant, resistant. And we can have a, a whole sliding scale for different types of plants. Um, now, when we say tolerance, the plant that is tolerant <coughs> to a disease, the disease can actually get in the plant, the disease can actually start growing in the plant, but the tolerance of the plant is that it can grow right through that infection. Susceptibility, the disease looks at it sideways and it gets it. And, and, and resistance, resistance is usually a genetic characteristic of the plant, and the plant has some mechanism of preventing the disease from establishing. Um, we can unfortunately influence both tolerance and resistance negatively by doing bad things to the plant, by not watering it appropriately, not pruning it appropriately, not fertilizing it correctly, over mulching, planting the plant too deep, planting the plant too shallow. Um, there's all kinds of horticultural things that we can do that can negatively influence tolerance and resistance to disease. Um, and then also the other thing that comes into play is the stage of development of the plant. For example, back to that um, Diplodia tip flight of Austrian pines. Um, when we first started planting Austrian pines, they looked like the most magnificent plant we ever introduced into a landscape. They, were, they would grow very rapidly. They had uh, what appeared to be little problems with insect and disease. Um, and in the first 15 or 20 years of the growth and development of those trees, they were magnificent until they hit reproductive age. And physiologically, they changed in size. Um, they changed their apparent allocation of materials toward from resistance to reproduction. And when they started reproducing, then they suddenly became susceptible to Diplodia tip flight. So 15 years of magnificent growth and then disease. And we weren't aware that that was gonna happen. By the time we found out that was gonna happen, we had so many thousands of these Austrian pines planted throughout the landscape. It's a disaster now. Um, extreme circumstances, um, extreme drought, extreme flooding, extreme cold, um, all of these can negatively impact our host, making it more susceptible to disease. How can we tell how well our plant might be growing? Well, uh, this is kind of a catchphrase these days, plant health versus plant stress. Um, and you know, the whole topic of plant health how do you keep plants healthy? Um, w w if we keep plants healthy, the, the idea is they won't be susceptible to disease or insects. Maybe they're a little less susceptible. It's not going to be perfect. Uh, but some will try to sell you that it's a perfect system. It's not. Um, so we, we're in a balancing act between plant health and plant stress. Now, probably one of the first things that we should consider is is that plant adapted to our area? You wouldn't believe the number of plants people try to shove into their landscape that should never have been brought into this area. A um, couple examples. We can't grow rhododendron and azalea in this area. Why not? What about our soil? There we go. That's one of the primary things is the pH of our soil. Um, both the rhododendrons and azaleas are acid-loving plants, which means they grow very, very well in sandstone-based soils. They're acidic. We are limestone-based soils. We are basically on the leaf. And so that's number one. Number two, they need well 
drained yet moist soil. We have cleansed. We have saturated, nasty, poorly drained clay. So again, it's they should never even <coughs> be considered for this area. Blueberries either. Blueberries either. Um, now there are some varieties of high bush blueberries that are being a, more adapted to our pH of soil. Uh, but drainage is still an issue. Um, we shouldn't be trying to grow mimosa trees around here. And I've seen this mimosa growing around here until we get a real heavy killing freezing and then they disappear pretty quickly. And so we, we do need to match our plants to our environment. That's the first part of plant health. Um, now the question is how do you know whether your plant is growing well or not? Is it under stress? Is it growing where it should be? Is it growing up to potential? Or is it falling way behind? And all of that is actually recorded in the growth of the plant itself. An example here, the Colorado blue spruce. This is the new candle from the current year. That's a good six to eight inches long. That's exactly what we want to see. This is another blue spruce. And the growth is about an inch. That's not doing well. And when you go back in that branch, you will see the growth pattern from year to year to year. So when you go from this inch here and go back, it's about an inch and a half, and go back, it's about two inches, and go back, it's about four inches, and go back, it's about five inches of growth. So it's been progressively getting worse over time. It's recorded in the structure of the plant, at least woody plants, so you can tell. Um, host resistance, uh, again, there's a number of different mechanisms of resistance, physical exclusion, like a waxy layer, chemical exclusion, defensive chemicals that grow in the plant itself. We used to call them secondary plant chemicals, and, and that was a poor terminology. We just didn't understand what their purpose was. Now that we know what their purpose is, they're primary plant chemicals because they're defensive chemicals to the plant. Uh, growth patterns um, <coughs> and the way a plant grows, for example, a tree, an oak tree or, or a maple tree. A lot of times uh, an oak tree or a maple tree may get infected, but they have mechanisms to basically um, surround that infection with tissue that won't allow the infection to spread as long as the tree is, is healthy. Um, and other trees simply just outgrow the damage uh, as long as they're healthy. Um, environmental conditions. There's optimal growing conditions both for the host plant as well as there's optimal growing conditions for the disease-causing organism. If you can mani manipulate that environment slightly in favor of one than the other, again, you give the host plant a better leg up. Um, so optimal growing condition, critical periods of time when the plant might be susceptible, moisture, temperature, wind, sun exposure, soil and soil fertility and soil pH, all of these factors need to be taken into consideration for health of the plant and potential exclusion of the disease-causing organism. Okay. Um, in, in, we'll see a few examples of this in a little bit. So, um, manipulating a host, you know, sometimes you know, one of your choices for your host is never plant that host because it's a god. It is host to every disease under the sun. It is such a finicky plant that you're you should always expect problems with it. If you know it's a finicky plant and you don't want to deal with those disease problems, don't plant it. It's a choice. Don't do it. Um, but there are other plants that have high resistance to different diseases bred into them. Look for resistance tags on the plants when you go to purchase it. That could be from an annual plant to a perennial tree. Um, tags, read the tags. Read the tags for what environment they should be in. Read the tags for what zone they should be planted in. Read the tags to see if they have any resistance to particular diseases. And if you can't find that information with the plant, go elsewhere. Don't buy it from there. Because if you don't have the information, 
it's not going to do you any good. Um, the pathogen, you know, manipulating the environment so it's not conducive to the pathogen. And in some cases, not every case, but in some cases, one of the pesticides may be the appropriate choice. Now, notice I didn't say that was your number one choice every time you're looking at something, but it shouldn't be ignored either. As an integrated pest management specialist, it's one of our tools. Doesn't necessarily need to be the very first one. But don't ignore it either. Could you mind naming some of those like lemons that we shouldn't plant other than the rhododendrons and azaleas? I already have an azalea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, actually, one of them that is rising higher and higher of our list of don't plant, Colorado blue spruce. And I have one that's dying. Yeah. It's old. Yeah, yeah. And, and our environment is changing I'm so not sure quickly. What sell them. Um, number one, think about what's it called? It's called a Colorado, Colorado blue spruce. <laughs> so where's it? What's it adapted to? Colorado. Colorado. It's, it's a mountainous plant. It it likes cool to cold temperatures. It needs moist yet well drained soils. So, um, if you think about the, that mountain climate and then think about summertime in Ohio. It's just no good for them anymore. <coughs> we we are, are on an annual basis, maybe not every year, but on several years in the, in the recent history, we get weeks where we've been 100 plus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not cool. And then even at night, the temperatures stay up in the 80s. That's not good for Colorado blue spruce. So it's most of our, unfortunately, most of our evergreens are being pushed out of consideration um, for this part of Ohio, which is sad. You know, I, I love my evergreens mm -hmm. until it fell on my house on Saturday. Um, but <laughs> I still like it. I, I feel bad that it's gone. We had a big Norway spruce, you know, trunk on it like this. Oh. Mm -hmm. Snapped off by the wind on Friday night, Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. uh, but. So th that's one example. Um, and, and there's others, I, j I just can't name them all off the top of my head. But as far as a, a major landscape plant, mm -hmm. Colorado blue spruce is sliding right off. Um, Austrian pine, I wouldn't recommend, recommend anybody plant that anymore. Other than if, you're, if you don't care, I, I just want it for 15 years after, I'll, I'll care about it. If, you, if, you, if you're not, set on saving absolutely every plant in your landscape, there are going to be temporary ones that you can plant. All right, so sometimes eradication is our only choice. Um, if the disease is significant enough or if it's an insect that's significant enough um, and it shows up in a landscape, our only choice is to get rid of it as quickly as possible. Um, our USDA, as well as our Ohio Department of Agriculture, does this on a regular basis. Um, this particular example of eradication, that's an eastern hemlock there. And the eastern hemlock grows very well in the eastern half of Ohio. But we had a new insect that arrived called the uh, woolly hemlock adelgid. And it's a horrible little invasive insect. And they found them on these eastern hemlocks that had been planted in the landscape um, they cut them all down, they packaged them all up, and burned them all in Reynoldsburg mm. to try to limit the spread of that insect. We would do this for disease as well, if it was a significant enough disease. Types of infectious diseases that we frequently will be dealing with, um, powdery mildew, we've already talked about powdery mildew, it's a fungus, uh, the rust diseases, and there are multitudes <coughs> of rust diseases out there, they're all fungi. Uh, leaf spots and blighting, that's both fungi and bacteria. And so we have to look carefully at what disease we're looking there. Root and crown rots, many of them are fungi. Cankers and tw twig blights, fungi and bacteria. Wilting diseases, fungi, bacteria, and nematodes. Yeah, that was the first time we really mentioned nematodes. Galls and knots, bacteria and nematodes, smuts and molds are fungi. And that's just a short list of diseases that are out there. But notice, uh, there's a lot of fungi mentioned in that list. 
And is that a, a matter of fungi dominate, or is it a matter of that's the ones that have really been studied well over time? And so we're biased by what we've learned, not necessarily what's just out there. And, and the more we study plants, the more of these organisms we're going to find. And so that list is going to shift over time. All right, so what's wrong with that tree right there? Well, what's the trees surrounding it? What are we? Stunning. I'm sorry? Well, yeah, that, it, it's not looking as good as the other ones, for sure. It's not growing as well as the other ones. Um, and it was probably planted the exact same time as the other ones. Too close. Uh, well, yeah, they are too close, which will contribute to problems. Um, as we get closer, you can see there's more and more dead brown branches in the tree. Um, that's Diplodia. These were Austrian pines. In any highway that you drive on up and down here in Ohio, we have so many Austrian pines planted along them, it's not funny. So, um, just some details. Diplodia was its genus name. They, they changed it to Sorotsis for a period of time. There was such flack that they got for changing the name, they took it back to Diplodia. <laughs> um, Diplodia pinei is its genus species name. You might occasionally see Sorotsis subpoena. Subpoena. Um, it is a fungus, so if we attempted to use any kind of pesticide, it would be a fungicide. Um, but the, the details of using that fungicide can be challenging because timing is everything. And the time is in the springtime when those new candles first start expanding. That's when you treat. If it's a prolonged wet spring, you may have to treat twice in the spring to start suppressing the spread of the disease. Um, it, the disease actually hits any of the two needle pines plus white pine. We see it most often in Austrian and Scots pine. In fact, Scots pine isn't being grown as a Christmas tree anymore because of the challenge of the Clodia tiptoe. Um, infection is greatest in trees once they reach that 15 to 25 years of age. That's when that physiological change occurs in people. Um, infections occur sometime around that new candle growth in the spring. And so, unless you're watching those trees almost on a daily basis to see when those new candles start expanding, you know what a candle is, right? Mm -hmm. and on, a, on an evergreen. That's the new growth for the year. It's called a candle. Um, and then uh, the disease is most prevalent on the lowest branches of the tree, uh, but it will spread up continuously on the tree. There, there's a, a tree on the Ohio Northern campus that just coincidentally, I started taking pictures of it over 20 years ago now. And almost on an annual basis, I was taking pictures of it. And it started out, it was only an eight-year-old tree. And I watched it grow year after year after year. It became an absolutely spectacular s specimen of Austrian pine. It was disease-free. It was, it was thick. It was well-branched from the ground all the way up. About seven years ago, Diplodia started showing up on it. Now, before, when you stood and looked at the tree, you couldn't see through it. Now, it's like a, a sheer curtain. You can see right through the tree. And the, the uh, ground screw have lopped the branches up this high on the bottom of it. So it's deteriorated in a, a fairly short period of time. Um, symptoms, uh, tip-like symptoms, resin flows. There's a lot of resin that comes oozing out of the tip flights dead brown needles, and when a new candle gets killed by Diplodia, they, they, it won't grow much more than that, and the needles on it will only be about an inch long, and they are sharp as sewing needles, amazingly sharp. Um, and uh, eventually it will spread back the branch. Cankers in the, in the branch can be huge, um, and then we can see actual signs of the disease where it's producing spores. And uh, so 
this, this is very, very early development of the disease. So it's just the current year's growth that has turned brown. Um, as that uh, grows for a couple of years, it's spreading deeper and deeper into the branch. And there's those really, really short needles there. This is a Scots pine that was infected with the protea. It's not quite as obvious on Scots as it is on Austrian, uh, but that weeping canker was on the Scots pine, uh, and that was deep in the branches. Um, those short needles in the candle in the fall, when you uh, un expose them toward the base, you will see these, these are called erup eruptinant pustules. A very descriptive way of saying that these spores are erupting through the, the surface of the needle. And then these cones, when you look at these cones up close, <coughs> all of those almost like look like pepper marks on the cone. Those are spore production sites for the disease. And if you know Austrian, Austrian pine holds on to those, can, uh, those cones for about two to three years before it drops them. So if they're an infected cone hanging up in the tree, it's just dispersing those spores right back into the tree. So how do we manage that disease? Well, one, don't plant Austrian pine. If you already have Austrian pine in the landscape, then you deal with the, the pathogen or the environment. And so the environment that would favor the Diplodia would be an environment where wind was cut. In other words, um, you're holding moisture around the tree for long periods of time. They, they're too crowded, they're too close together. There's not enough wind current going through them to dry the needle surface to prevent infection. Now, a lot of people like to plant them around their pond that they've installed on the property. That's ideal for moisture to come up out of the pond and keep those needles wet for long periods of time. So, avoid crowding, avoid wet areas that would have a lot of moisture available. And then the pathogen itself, sanitation. Clean up all the needles and all of the cones that might be on the ground. Now that kind of like, well, that's why I planted those pines in the first place. I wanted that mat of needles underneath there. Well, if you want Austrian pine, you're gonna have to get rid of that. Um, the other thing that when it comes to sanitation, if you have limbs that are showing a lot of symptoms, cut them off. <coughs> Cut them all the way back to the trunk of the tree. Don't leave a stob there because it's never going to re-sprout needles. Yeah, Take it off to the trunk and get it off the property. All right, now uh, we just went through that list there. So if I burn it, I shouldn't burn it in my property. But well, if you burn it, if you're allowed to burn it, you know that's a little bit of a debatable issue even out in the country anymore. Um, <coughs> if I don't form a form. <laughs> You know, you don't have to worry about burning it and having the spores come That's flying out of the fire. You know, if you, if you burn it at the right well, I've been point. trying to grow a uh, windbreak, and I know yeah. I've got Austrian pine in it. Yeah, yeah. That's I'm unfortunate. getting that brown stuff. Well, there's actually two potential diseases in Austria. If it's not Diplodia, it's Dothystroma, and that's a needle blight. So there's two hammers that are chipping away at your Austrian pine. We have a stand of white pine, and it's starting, and so, but it's just a little bit. <laughs> now, with white pine, if you're just seeing a little bit of brownness out toward the tips of the needles, right. that's usually winter injury. Um, they desiccate easily during the winter, and it, it will start turning brown from the tip part way back the needle. Um, so that's more environmental condition than it is disease. I still, still pull up all, uh, rake up all the, <coughs> the needles from the base. Um, white pine is very low on the list of susceptibility okay. to diplodia, so no, I wouldn't worry about that. Good. Not on white pine. Good. Two needle pines, yes. Five needle pine, which is white, no. Okay. Um, what's that? What's that leaf? Anybody recognize the leaf? It is rose. And the, the spots on like there, spot. that's the most prominent disease 
of roses. Black spot. Black spot. If you're a rosarian, I just said a swear word. <laughs> Black spot. Um, Black spot is uh, the most damaging disease to a number of our roses. Many of them are really, really susceptible to black spot. It is a fungal disease. It's an almost omnipresent disease. However, um, it does start from leaves that have fallen on the ground the year before. So sanitation is going to be one of the significant things with, with black spot. On a susceptible rose, the disease starts on the lowest leaves on the plant because it's splashed up from the soil surface onto the lowest leaves. It infects those lowest leaves, they sporulate. The next rain, they splash up higher. The next rain, they splash up higher, and they just progressively go up that susceptible plant. By mid-season, all you have left is the blossom on the top of the stem, okay? So for the really susceptible varieties of roses, this is a nightmare of a disease. So, um, yeah, it, this is symptomology. It started out with just the black spots on the leaves. As it progresses, the leaves get chlorotic, <coughs> and the more chlorotic they get, eventually they will be dropped off the plant and to the ground. Um, so there's uh, uh, black spots on the leaf. You can also get black spots on the canes of the plant. So when it's a really highly infected plant, there's big lesions on the, the canes. And occasionally those lesions will go all the way around the circumference of the, the cane and it's going to die from that point upwards. Um, so when it comes to sanitation, if you're seeing black spots on the canes, you need to cut the canes off as well. Uh, didn't do, that's we just looked at all those. It does overwinter on fallen leaves on the ground as well as in infected canes. So if you've had a really bad season of black spot, um, your canes may be a, a major a problem. The fungus splashes from old tissue to new tissue or from the ground to the tissue and it thrives when you keep those leaves wet. All right, so. With that in mind, how do we control it? Looking at that disease triangle and trying to figure out what leg of that triangle to kick out, number one is environmental manipulation. You need to keep that foliage as dry as possible. So, how do you water your roses? Spray water underground. Yeah, you want to use a drip irrigation. You don't want to stand out there with your hose going, oh, look at the pretty rainbow when I spray it all over the place. <laughs> and the worst time to water your roses is in the evening. What? Yes. Yeah. The absolutely worst time to water is because once you wet those leaves in the evening, they may be wet all night long. And the other thing is, if you're standing out there with your hose shooting it up in the air or you're using a lawn sprinkler to go back and forth, you're simulating rain. And when those little droplets of water come down and hit the ground, you're splashing spores up into the plant. Keep it dry, keep it on the ground. Okay? Sanitation, clean up dead leaves. Um, disease control, um, you can use a fungicide. There are very effective fungicides to control black spot, but you gotta spray on a weekly basis to keep control. Um, resistant, there are definitely resistant hybrids of roses. <coughs> so when you replace roses that have died, look for resistance. Now, the only challenge with that is some of these, and I, I always forget the, the, the brand name, the, the, the big roses that are on the market these the days. The knockouts, right? The knockouts, yes. Yeah. The knockouts are very resistant to mm -hmm. black spot. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. So what's one of the problems with knockout roses? Spectacular color. Mm -hmm. What's that? They don't smell, do they? They have zero scent. Yeah. So if you want a very rosy smelling rose, knockouts are not going to do it for you. In their attempts to breed resistance into the roses, they bred the scent out of 
So you can shove your nose in that rose and <laughs> suck in as much as you want. You're not going to smell the delightful scent of an old-fashioned rose. They're, they're scentless. Now, hopefully they're working on that a little bit. Um, so what roses are resistant to black spot? There are some hybrid tea roses, um, such as Chrysler Imperial or Tropicana. Uh, those are the names of them. Uh, Four Abundas or Grandifolias, uh, Betty Pryor and Sonia. Shrub Roses, All That Jazz and Carefree Wonder. Miniatures, um, Gourmet Popcorn and Rose uh, Gillardi. And Rogosa Hybrids. Um, now, the only problem with this list is the fungus may mutate and get around this resistance. So this is going to be an ever-changing <coughs> list. So you just have to watch. What's wrong with this tree? It's big. <laughs> yeah, they usually do. People don't prune them regularly as they should. Uh, but this is in July that this picture was taken. <laughs> and I will tell you, in the springtime, it had one of the most spectacular floral displays of any tree in the landscape. And it's not calorie care. And it comes in pinks and whites red and crab red crab apples. This is an, an old hybrid crab apple tree. And what is it most susceptible to? The scab. Apple scab. And some of our oldest, sometimes some of our most spectacular blooming crab apples are 100% susceptible to apple scab. And that apple scab disease is a fungus, and it, it will have multiple cycles in a single year. And it will go back into the same tree and infect again and again and again. That's not always the case for all of our diseases, such as those um, cedar apple rusts, that octopus of a, uh, a spore-producing structure, the spores that come out of that octopus on the eastern red cedar cannot reinfect the eastern red cedar. It is absolutely mandatory that it goes from the red cedar to a rose. And then the spores that are produced on the rose plant, whether that's apple or hawthorn or uh, whatever it may be, are absolutely must go back to the eastern red cedar to complete the life cycle. So, but in this case, apple scab can go back <coughs> in and again and again and again on the same host plant. Um, even the, the fruits could get scabs on the surface of the fruit. Now, the apple scab can infect orchard trees, especially some of the older varieties of apples, Jonathan's and Granny Smith's and others. And you can get sizable scab-looking infections on the surface of the apple fruit. The interesting thing is, it is entirely a surface infection. If you peel that part of the skin off, it's completely edible underneath it. But try to put a scabby apple in the produce section <laughs> of a supermarket. <laughs> they will never sell. It'll never sell. Um, so, Crab apples are notorious for apple scab. This, sometimes when the, uh, the infection gets so immense, it's called sheet scab because it just covers the entire leaf. And then eventually the crab apple tree physiologically says this is no longer functional and drops the leaves. And a number of, the, well there's the orchard apple tree with apple scab. And there's the scabs on the apples there. But one thing that does happen with the fruit, if the fruit is still in the process of expanding in size, um, those scabs are not flexible. And the skin will split around those scabs. Does that affect prune, prune trees also? Scab on prune. No. Because prunes are stone fruits. Mm -hmm. uh, apples are palm fruits. So um, different fruits are, are fruit trees. So no scab does not get there. Um, here you can see a whole line of crab apples that have completely become defoliated. So how do we manage scab? 
resistance is our number one choice. So will those that have like completely defoliated like that? They'll come right back next year. I was going to say, they'll come back next year. Okay. Yeah. Year we'll after year after year. And you'll keep doing that. But they'll do the yes. same thing. They'll be beautiful yeah. in spring. By July, they're naked huh. and ugly in the landscape. Um, so uh, resistance is our number one choice. Sanitation is it, and fungicides can work, but you gotta do it over and over and over again. And so here's an example of resistance. Um, this is a crab apple here, this is a crab apple here, and that's a crab apple there. So I was showing you three levels of resistance. 100% susceptible, moderately susceptible, 100% resistant. So it is functional. Now the only problem with that, again, the fungus can mutate over time. And so um, our list of resistance changes over time. No, we don't need to look at those. Well, life cycle of the, the apple scab, um, you can see that it overwinters on infected leaves on the ground in the springtime. It, it releases those spores into the air. They infect the new living leaves and it will cycle over and over and over again in the tree. It can infect the fruit, it can infect the leaves, and then it's just that continuous cycle year after year. Sanitation, you, know, you can try to clean up the, the fruit, you can clean up the leaves. Um, trying to keep the inoculum out of the, the landscape, but crab apples are so omnipresent everywhere that they're going to blow in from outside your own yard. Does the little shoe still have that uh, the booster, yep. the ATI, that has like the whole crab apple? It's called Crablandia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and that's, that is our screening trial. And uh, there are a couple of our educators that monitor them on an annual basis, rating them for uh, susceptibility to resistance. And I've been involved in some of those publications. Yep, and that's available online to see the results of those. Um, rust, you know, there's all kinds of rust. This is another one where, like powdery mildew, they all are called rust. There's hawthorn cedar rust, there is quince cedar rust, there's apple cedar rust, there's uh, rusts of turf grass, there's rust of wheat plants, uh, and there's rusts of may apple trees, and the, the list goes on and on. And each of these rust diseases are specific to their particular host plants. For example, we have the juniper cedar rust, um, that's the hawthorn, quince, and apple. It goes from eastern red cedar to a rosaceous coast. Um, apple trees are roses. They're just big roses. Okay. Um, black stem rust of wheat. This is Japanese barberry as its alternative host in wheat plant. And this is another disease that has to go from wheat to barberry, from barberry back to wheat. Um, when we run into situations where there's a lot of wheat rust around, it can be exceedingly damaging to the wheat crop. Um, Japanese barberry is the primary alternative host. So it's a, a non-native plant that hosts the, the rust in them. Uh, white pine blister rust, and this is a, a, a horrible disease of white pines. White pine blister rust goes between gooseberries and white pines. Now we don't have it in Ohio as of yet. However, Michigan is polluted with it. So it's just across the border from Ohio. Um, and I've seen it and the devastation that it does to white pine. It, it's just horrible. Is it uh, not gooseberry in Ohio? I've never seen a gooseberry yeah, in Ohio. It, it's yeah. not yeah. as yeah. prevalent as it is in other really? woodlots. It is a woodlot yeah. plant. Right. Um, and I run into it occasionally. Mm -hmm not massive plantings of or growths of it, but it's here, here and there. Is it a native plant? Gooseberry, yeah. Um, and notice all of these are, are going back and forth between alternative posts. May apple rust, that little herbaceous plant on the forest floor, is autoecious, which means that rust only hits may apple. And it cycles only on may apple. So there's the apple cedar rust or cedar apple rust doll. Uh, there's the lesions on the apple leaves. 
from the cedar apple leaf, and there's the spore elation out the bottom of the leaf that sends the spores back to the eastern red cedar. Here's another gall on eastern red cedar, much, much tinier. It's not much bigger than a BB, a large BB. Um, that's the cedar hawthorn rust. And that goes to hawthorn trees, and there's the rust lesions on the hawthorn leaves. And there's the leaf pustules coming out the bottom of the leaf, just like on the, the apples. And that's an up close of, of those spore producing structures. And then there's cedar quince rust. Now, instead of growing from a gall out on the foliage, it's a gall in the stem of the plant. And when this is actively producing spores, it looks like orange snot stuck to the stem. And then as it dries out, the spores then go to hawthorn and infect the fruit on hawthorn. And th those fruits will look like medieval maces. Um, and then the amount of spores that they produce is just huge. And it will turn, turn your hands orange. Um, some, of the, some of the turf grass rust diseases, they'll ch change, turn your white shoes orange wow. walking through them. Um, at one time, the cedar apple rust was a much bigger, bigger problem before resistance was bred into the apples. And there were laws on the books in Ohio that any eastern red cedar within a mile to a mile and a half of an apple orchard had to be destroyed to protect the apples from uh, apple cedar rust. Now, now there were campaigners on both sides of that issue. Um, you, you can either have your cedar or cider <laughs> for those that didn't want the eastern red cedar and then those that did cider or pencils. <laughs> because in the 20s and 30s and 40s, our number two school pencil, mm -hmm. the wood that it was made out of was cedar, <laughs> eastern red cedar. And so um, that, that was kind of a heated problem back then. Not nearly as dramatic today as it was then. Um, it, it's not an overly significant disease anymore uh, simply because the plants that are involved aren't as important as they had been. And it is an ab absolute obligate cycler back and forth between its al alternative hosts. Management of rust, you know, don't plant one of the hosts in close proximity to the other. Um, <coughs> resistant cultivars, there are some in, in terms of the apple. Um, Hand-picked galls off the juniper, which could be a major task, depending on how big the juniper is. And then potential fungicide treatments on the apple trees, not the juniper. <coughs> there's turf grass rust, and there's a couple of different turf grass <coughs> species that are very susceptible to it. Uh, the main management idea of this is keep the grass growing rapidly. Fertilize it, water it, and mow it frequently. If you mow it frequently, you're cutting the pustules off so they never get to sporulation stage. There's the May apple rust. That's the one that just hits May apple and nothing else. There's also a rust of hollyhocks. Who, who doesn't grow hollyhocks someplace around your house? I you don't have any hollyhocks. You really? Yeah. Uh, usually they're, they're, they're almost like weeds. They mm -hmm. sell That's seeds so frequently. Uh, but there's several things that hit hollyhocks. Uh, rust is one di uh, a disease. There's a, a hollyhock weevil that hits the seeds. And there is a hibiscus sawfly uh, that hits the leaves of the hollyhocks and just makes a, a complete doily out of the leaves and will defoliate the whole plant from top to bottom. Uh, so there's, it, uh, of course, hollyhock is a Malvaceae, and so there's some weed Malvaceae members that are the alternate hosts. Uh, very common. <laughs> powdery mildews. And, and we've already talked a bit about powdery <coughs> mildews in terms of um, they're almost omnipresent every year. I, I can go to just about any old-fashioned lilac and find powdery mildew by July. Um, powdery mildew of roses, powdery mildew of dogwood. Now, 
So on Dobwoods, pottery and mildew shows up a little bit differently. And although we don't have a lot of, of um, the flowering dogwoods around this area, when it gets hit with powdery mildew, you see a little bit of the powdery characteristic, but the other characteristic is it causes the leaf to redden in color. So it's a little bit unusual there. Powdery mildew of oak leaves, powdery mildew of horse chestnut. Uh, so you can see that the list goes on and on. Powdery mildew of some of our perennial plants, uh, perennial phlox. There are also vegetables such as zucchinis and watermelons and pumpkins. Um, they can all get a powdery mildew as well. What do you do about powdery mildew on most of those plants? Nothing at all. Now, what do you do about powdery mildew on your perennial plants? Well, those that are most susceptible, plant them in the back of the garden where nobody sees them because you're only interested in the bloom at the top anyway. Um, and for your vegetable crops, it depends on the vegetable. If it's your zucchini, you're, you can't wait for powdery mildew to wipe the plant out. <laughs> um, but for pumpkins and some of the watermelons, you might need to use a fungicide spray to manage them into the season. All right, so abiotic plant problems. And we'll, we'll very quickly run through a couple of these just to remind ourselves that we can have environmental things that mimic disease when they're actually not. And in there, we can see with problems with the icers and salts, compacted soils and excess water, wires and ropes that weren't removed appropriately, and natural needle drop that we get in our evergreens. So here, um, this is a, a very familiar problem to us. Uh, when new developments uh, put in a berm between a street and the new housing development, how do they get that berm to stay in place? Well, they take a caterpillar tractor with a device, a roller on the back, which is called a clove hooved roller, and they smash that soil as densely as they can to get it to stay in place. And then they have the landscaper come along and dig a hole to plant a tree in. Now, what they've done is they've dug a vase a bowl that fills with water and never drains. And that ends up causing diminishing health of all those evergreens. Wind damage, you know, constant wind blowing from one direction during the winter can do some severe damage. Or if this is that berm right next to the road, all of the de-icer salts that go onto that uh, get thrown up in the air in a spray by the passing vehicles and all that salt gets blown onto one side of the tree and burns the needles off the tree. And again, that's just the, the berm construction and then planting all the trees, and then the trees die shortly thereafter. Um, flooding, you know, we have to remember what's happened in the history of the plant at one time or another. Um, saturated soils, when you have a dead plant that gets pulled out of the ground and this is what's behind within 24 hours, that's not the place for a plant to be planted. Um, here you can see drainage around the base of this plant. With that much saturation, you know that plant's standing in water. Um, it's not good for it. Um, this was on the OSU Lima campus, uh, and this was on a hill plateau. But the water perched up there and just drowned the roots of these conifers there. Here's a wire that was never taken off of the conifer. Um, and the tree eventually just snapped off because the, it was preventing any production of proper wood there. There's a rope that was never taken off, a nylon rope. They have to be cut away. Otherwise, they're going to girdle the trunk of the tree eventually. And then natural needle drop. This is an eastern white pine tree in September. And you can see there's a lot of yellow needles on that tree. This is normal. Some years, needle drop is excessive on these trees, and it really is startling to see that many needles turn yellow on your evergreen. Now, the, the point here is, as long as it's not the newest growth turning yellow, this is normal needle drop. And there's a lot of evergreens that do a needle drop, and it varies depending on the species as how often they do needle drop and how abundantly. Um, for example, taxes. 
Everybody knows what a U is, that little shrub that gets planted around foundations. Mm -hmm. It has a needle drop. But the bizarre thing is, its needle drop is in the spring, not in the fall. Mm -hmm. So you'll get a bunch of yellow needles in your taxes in the springtime. American holly, it sheds its leaves in the spring, those that it's going to drop for that year. Um, all, of the, all of the pine trees do a needle drop at, at varying times. Some, it may be two to three years <coughs> needles before they drop out of the tree. So this is another, you got to know your tree and what's normal for it and what's not. With that, I will stop here. I took a course from a lady years ago at Finley um, on herbs. Uh -huh. And her brother lived in Michigan at the time, and he was a mint farmer. Mm -hmm. Got rust. Really? And it... Wiped him out. Wiped him out. He moved back to Ada because of it. He just... Um, you know, he, uh, mint used to be a major cash crop around Ada. Really? Yeah. Mint used to be grown for the, its oils in Ada. Wow. And then the industry moved to Michigan. And the reason being is there are more cloudy days here than there are in Michigan. And as a result of that, the oil content in the mint in Michigan was much higher than the oil content wow. in Ada. So, so that used to be a past industry in Ada. I did not know that. Any, any other questions? I just, uh, I read the Amish farmer in the newspaper, and it, he planted a whole bunch of chestnut trees. Will those get? Depends on what kind of chestnut that he planted. There is a Chinese chestnut, and then there's the American chestnut. Chinese survives just fine. The American chestnut, um, we haven't gotten a, a resistant <coughs> hybrid as of yet. Yeah. So Do they still sell the chestnut? Oh, okay. The Chinese or the American? The American. No, it's not on the market as of yet. Um, they have found some native stands of American chestnut trees on a ridge top down in Georgia. And they're looking at whether they're resistant or whether the environment that they were in was just not conducive for the fungus. I just worry because he passed away. I don't know if you read the column in the, it's in the newspaper once a week and he's kind of was No, I haven't. So, okay. he, he died clearing the ground for that, and then they planted oh. the chestnuts. And I, I suspect they're Chinese chestnuts okay. rather than American. Don't regret it. Huh? Don't regret it. <laughs> yeah, China, the China. chestnut halls are not no. fun China. to play with. Um, they are armored to the max. And you better have good welding gloves to handle them. Wow. Yeah, they are sharp. Who says? Chestnut, uh, uh, oh. Chinese chestnut trees. Other questions?